Hello, it's Keith here, and this is the first in a new series which we're going to be calling the YQuest series. Now, YQuest is a little game that I actually wrote on the Amstrad CPC during my live streams. I've got a live streaming channel called Chibi Akamas Live, and um, once a week I do some programming I'm live at 5 a.m. in the morning in Japan time, which is a crazy time to work, but actually I managed to get some work done. And um, what I did is I took the simple series joystick routine that we looked at before, where we did a simple drawing of a bitmap, a smiley face, and moved it around the screen with the joystick control and I extended that all the way up to a little game and I'm now in the process of porting this to a variety of different systems. Um, now the game itself is a sort of parody remake of the um, DOS game X-Quest which was something I enjoyed and it was a nice simple little game that it was um, plausible to remake and make into something that I could have on multiple systems. So um, this game is free and it's open source. You can go to my website and download the Z80 sources, it's in there and you're welcome to do whatever you want with it. You can re-modify it and you can sell it if you manage to, good luck to you. Um, you're welcome to do that, you don't need to give any credit to me if you don't want. So um, the idea is I'm hoping this will be a bit interesting for people from the point of view of seeing what kind of things it took to do a game. You can see the actual procedure of making it in the live streams and also so you can download it and use it as a template if it helps you. So in that sort of aim, we're going to be going over the source code of the game today and we're going to be starting to learn it. This is going to be quite a long series because there's a lot of source code. We're going to break it down into stages. But first of all, let's just have a look at the game. So you can see we're controlling the Y cursor in the middle of the screen here. Um, and when I press a direction, that changes the acceleration. I have to collect all of the crystals to get to the next level and I have to avoid the enemies and the static mines and I can fire, I just hit a, hit a mine there, that wasn't very smart, but you can see I can fire and I can kill the enemies, but they will respawn again. So um, the enemies on the later levels will also fire. When I collect all of the crystals, we get a level complete message and we progress to the next level. So um, let's say a nice simple little game there. It's got 16 levels in total after that they'll cycle and um, di di different levels have different number of crystals. This level has eight crystals, but only five ever show on the screen. So you can see there when I was collecting one, it was respawning somewhere else on the screen. Um, this is because of the um, limits of the sort of data arrays that are being used to, oh, got, got far too fast there and lost control. Anyway, as I say, I, it wasn't really designed to be a amazing game of any standard. It was just designed to make a, to take the example joystick controlling simple bitmap routine and to prove that that could be built up into a legitimate game that you know one could be legitimately sort of proud of doing as a beginner project. So we're going to have a look at this today. Of course this is very similar to my pre previous Grime Z80 series and that was later on the 6502 and 68000 which I actually took a week off work and I wrote a, a similar sort of style of game and of course that's also free and open source so please take a look at that as well if that's of help to you. Anyway, for today, we're going to be looking at the source code. We're going to start off by having a look at the structures of the memory and the data. Uh, we're then going to progress into the common code that's common to all the systems. And then we're going to finally look at the platform specific code, which is the code that handles the joystick and graphics of each individual system. So the, the game is kind of split into sections, right? So here, for example, is the Sam Coupe code, and this is the drawing routines, the key reading routines, and a few other common routines, uh, sprites, and the rest is all common code. And we will have a look at that common code later on. Now, what we're going to start off today with is the definitions of the RAM and the data. Because this game was designed to work on ROM-based systems, cartridge-based systems, and also sometimes RAM-based systems, I put all of the um, data that could change in one common block, and that block will be moved around depending on the system. On something like the CPC, it'll probably be somewhere near the program code, but on a system like the MSX or the Master System, the ROM is probably very low down and the RAM is very high up. So we just need to be able to move it around as required. First thing I've done here is I've defined the common object layout. Now, all of the sprites in this game, the player, the bullets, and also the enemy sprites, all have a common eight byte format that defines that object as it's to be drawn. So when we want to draw that object, we just pass the point to the data, to the drawing routine, and all the rest is done for us. Now, because of that, we have to define what each byte in that eight byte block is going to mean. And that's what these offsets do here. So the first byte is a sprite number 0 to 255. The sprite number is selected from the bank of bitmap data. We'll see that in the platform specific code later on. 
There's a, an unused byte here. Originally, um, I was specifying memory addresses and I changed it, so I was just using a single byte. But um, th there was an unused byte. I could, if I was extending the code, making the um, AI more advanced or something, use that or maybe use it for a respawn timeout. But at the moment, it's spare. There's an X and Y position, which is the position on screen. The coordinate system is actually common to all of the systems. It's basically um, from 0 to 128 or 160 wide, depending on the size of the screen, whether it's 256 or 320 pixels wide. And it's lines down, so um, each Y coordinate is a single line of the screen. And we have to convert those a little bit depending on the hardware. But that means that the common code works in a consistent way. We've then got an acceleration for the object. Now, if we want the object to move automatically, then we can use those accelerations. Alternatively, we can manually override them. Some of like the seeking enemies that will move towards the player, they don't use the acceleration, but the acceleration is still used in, for those objects by the bullet code, because when the enemy fires, the acceleration is used to decide which direction the bullet should be shooting in. So those are used for that. Program is the movement pro program that defines how an object will move. Zero means a static or something like the player, which is controlled separately. Um, other numbers will define a, an enemy movement pattern that is used to define how that enemy moves about. Collision program does a few other things. Primarily, um, if, if it's a zero, then this is defined as an enemy object. If it's a one, then it's a crystal that we can collect. The three is the bullets and um, 255 is an object that's currently unused. So if you try and draw an object and its collision program is 250 or above, it won't draw. 255 is an undefined object that's spare. 254 is a killed object that is not been respawned yet, an enemy that's been shot. They will respawn at some point later, but not yet. So that, the collision program handles all of that. It's just a way of sharing a byte for the two purposes of whether the object was alive or dead, and also what the actual rules of that object were when the player collided with it. Now, those are just symbols defining the layout of the data block for the sprites. The actual RAM, we're using something called user RAM. That will be defined as a position in the platform-specific code, for example, at hexadecimal 7000 on this system, but it will depend on the system where that is. So we're starting off at YQuest RAM somewhere in memory, and we don't know where it's going to be. So every object we're defining, every symbol, is defined as an offset relative to the previous one. So cursor Y is at the start of YQuest RAM. And that's a one byte definition. And cursor X, because cursor Y was one byte, starts one byte after cursor Y. And you can see they're all working like this. And the, the effect is that we can move things around if we wanted to move this to, um, to for example, here. Then we would need to change the start of this one to be lives plus one, and then we need to change level to be player SFX plus one. So we, we th these are just there. Each one's an offset from the last one so that we can just move the base and all the other objects will move accordingly. That's the way I've done it in this case. So we're gonna go over each of these and I'm gonna tell you what they do so that later when we're looking at the code, you'll have some idea of you know, what is going. But also of course, because we're gonna be discussing what data we're storing, you should get an idea of how the program is working internally to a small extent, and then later we'll see the code. So X and Y position for the cursor. This is to do with font drawing. We've um, seen this maybe in some of our previous tutorials. So if we draw a character to the screen, like if we're printing Hello World, we'll print the H and then we'll want to print the E and we want the E to be one character across from the H. And so that's what these are for. They're just to remember where the last character was printed so that the next character carries on and we can print strings accordingly. They're not used for the sprite routines. Sprite frame, this is, um, we have four banks of sprites. Each, there's, there's basically 16 sprites in the game for the um, enemies and the player and things, but there's four alternative versions with frames of animation. So sprite frame goes from zero to three and then loops around. And this allows us to have some nice animation. But if we were programming a very limited system with not much memory, we could cut down the number of sprite banks to maybe two or just one and still have the game working. Uh, but we've got um, the, the ability for better animation where the memory allows it. So that's what sprite frame is for. Bullet array, this is eight bytes per object. And we're defining eight objects here because you can tell the next one is eight times eight alongwards. And this is the set of bullets that the player is shooting. The player can shoot up to eight bullets on screen. If they try and shoot a ninth, they won't be able to. And these are in the format that you can see just here.
So that's why we're defining eight bytes for each of the eight bullets here. So that's what the bullet array is. Uh, that's the player one. The enemy one is exactly the same. The code that handles them is almost the same. And so those two are the player bullets and the enemy bullets. The object array. This is the objects that appear in the game. This includes crystals that we have to collect, mines that we have to avoid, and enemies that are going to come chasing after us. The player is also an object, but it's not part of the object array. The bullets, uh, enemy and player, are both objects, but they're not part of these arrays. They're separate arrays just here. And the player one is actually down here. We'll see that in a moment. Invincibility. This is a one byte counter. If the if this is greater than zero, the player is invincible for a short period. They've either been hurt or the level's just started. The player icon will flash and any time they're hit, it won't affect them. Random seed. This is two bytes. You can tell that because the next object starts two bytes after random seed. This is for my random number generator. I borrowed it from Chibi Aliens. It's actually a 16-bit random number generator. So that's why it needs a two byte random seed key timeout. This is to do with the acceleration. If we hold down the up button, we don't want to accelerate too fast, otherwise we'll quickly lose control. So key timeout is a way of ignoring the uh, immediate press. If, if the button's being held down, we want to not process too much acceleration. So that's what that does. Lives, number of player lives they've got left. They gain a life after every level. Level number starts at zero. Each time you collect all the crystals, you move up a level. If you get to level 17, it'll be exactly the same as level one. They just repeat around. 16 levels was as much as I could manage to code for this. Crystals. This is the remaining crystals on the level. Now, you have to remember they're not all shown at the same time. There's a limit of five shown on screen at a time because there's a limit of 40 objects on screen at a time. So we don't want to have too many of them as the crystals. We'd leave nothing left for enemies playing SFX. This is the sound effect that's currently being played. Now, the sound effects in YQuest are being done by Chibi Sound. This was the um, driver that I wrote for my Grimes Z80 project. It was covered in my tutorials on making sounds, so uh, we're not going to cover it here because we've done it before. Playing SFX is the sound that's currently being made. Playing SFX2 was the last sound that was being made. If they're different, we need to call Chibi Sound to update things. If they're the same, then we don't make any sound at all. We just keep letting whatever was currently playing play. There was some clicks happening when, um, if you repeatedly set zero, you see. So um, I just made that um, check that only update the sound when the sound has changed and not when the sound is the same as before. Score and high score. These are binary coded decimal, four bytes, so eight digits. We're using the exact same code that um, Grime Z80 used. We um, did some binary decim coded decimal code for that. We're sharing the same code just for speed here, because this was um, this was done in nine, roughly two hour um, live streams. So not much time spent on it, but it was um, it was about all I could um, <laughs> all I could manage. It's quite stressful programming at 5 a.m. on a live stream with everyone watching you mess up. Okay, the player object. Now the player object is eight bytes because it's the same definition as here. And um, we're actually um, defining it, but then we're defining labels that re represent the individual parts of that player object because we're going to be changing the player object in ways that we don't do to the other objects. Because the player object, rather than being moved by a, just a program, is also going to be affected. The acceleration is going to be affected by the cursor presses, you see. So we've got, um, we've got that eight byte player object broken out with a few symbols here as well as the player X and Y, we have a last pos X and last pos Y, and this is to do with repositioning the objects if they go off the screen. So um, that's what those are there for. And that's actually everything. The rest is just some rimmed out um, early test code, so we don't need to worry about that. That's all of the memory definitions that this program uses. There's no self-modifying code, and there's no other definitions in, in mixed in with the code because that wouldn't work nicely with ROM. So there we go. So that's the data we've got defined. Now let's have a look at the predefined data that doesn't change as the game is playing. So um, these, these are going to work fine in fixed ROM. Let's go over them now. First, we've got here a backup of the player object definitions. So basically, these are primarily to center the player and also zero some of the settings. So when the player needs to be reset because they've been hit or the level starts, we just copy these bytes over the player object and that will initialize the player. We're defining the size of the object in bytes, the number of enemies, the bullet count, and the on-screen crystals. These uh, never change, and I just wrote them as symbols in the early code, just in case I just changed my mind and decided I needed more bullets, or if maybe the object 
byte size of 8 was too small and I needed to up it to 10 or 16. So um, they're, they're just in there with symbols. The level map is a sequence of pointers to the level data and this defines what the levels actually contain. The level definitions, although the positions of the objects is random, the objects that appear are fixed and they're predefined. So each of these is a pointer to a list and you can see there, I see them all here. So just taking one at random, let's take this one. The first line is special. The first line, the first byte, is the number of crystals the player has to collect. So level one, you have to collect three. Level two, you have to collect five. And these ones, you have to collect eight. The next byte here, this is unused, doesn't do anything. Um, just keeping the uh, byte organization even. So I just put a dummy byte in there. And then every other line is a definition of some kind of object. The last one is a definition of 255 zero objects. Once um, the level in initialization routine gets to the limit of 40 objects, you see it gives up. So a definition of 0, 0,255 is effectively the end of the level definition. So in this case, we're defining that there are going to be two of object type 3, and this is defining two of object type 1. Now there's a text description here, but these definitions we will see further down. Maybe if we just scroll down here, we'll see them. Here they are. So these are the enemy definitions. So object definition two is this line here. They use a slightly different format to the um, objects in memory. So, so these templates are in a different format. Um, maybe they should have been the same, but they're not. So the first byte, which is this byte here, is the sprite number. The second byte is the collision program. The third byte is the program number, then the X and Y acceleration, and there's three unused bytes. I've um, kept things organized to an eight byte boundary because it makes it easier with bit shifting to select the memory address. But these are the definitions of all the object types we can have. So object type zero is unused, and that's why the end of our level definition is always a, a object type zero. One is something called the slow purple. That's an enemy type. T two is the crystal. Three is the fast blue. Four is the mine, and we've got some weird names for all of our other kinds of enemy here. And, um, and that should be 12 there, that's obviously a typo. It should be a cloud, a cloud should be 12. So these are our object definitions, and again, this is the structure of the object definitions here. We've got an align command here, which unfortunately has to be different depending on if we're using Vasm or WinApe. The game was originally written in WinApe but uh, it will compile in Vasm, of course, as well. I'm using Vasm now. It's quicker for me to develop in WinApe because of the debugger's better, but um, Vasm is preferable because it's multi-platform. So we're aligning because we've got some random number um, lookup tables here. Uh, the Chibi Aliens random number generator does use some lookup tables to get good random numbers. And so there's two here and that needs to be aligned to a 16 byte boundary here so that we can just use the bottom nibble for an offset. Then we've got some strings here. There's two versions of some of these strings. That's because um, the game was designed to work on a, a minimum of 32 um, tiles or characters wide screen, but uh, it also works on the game gear and the game gear is only 20 characters wide. So I had to reduce the length of some of the strings. The strings are 255 terminated as they are in all of my tutorials. So um, that's how that works. And we'll be using those in our code later on. Then we've got some binary de coded decimal templates here. The add routine for adding score to the player, the two binary coded decimal numbers need to be the same length in bytes that we're adding together. So the score's four bytes, so the score to add has to be four bytes. So one point, five points, and 30 points there. Those are the three options that we can add. And then finally here, we've got the um, title screen. Uh, these numbers here, uh, they, they could be packed better. We could have maybe had two tiles in a single byte, but I didn't bother because we're not short of memory for such a small game. But this is basically the YQuest title screen. You probably can't see it here. Maybe if I zoom out, you can kind of see there. That one's nicely aligned. There's the Y. There's the weird um, slow purple with its kind of rabbit ears there. These ones aren't aligned properly, so you can't see it. But that, that is the title screen. And if we just go back here, that's what you could see just there. So if you wanted to create your own title screen, you could do that. And that code was basically the same as the Grime Z81, I think. I think I copied the code. Maybe I'm wrong, I can't remember. It's a while ago. Anyway, um, that's 
all we're going to cover for this one. We're going to be doing some more Y-Quest. We're going to go into the other code and um, we're going to go into detail. But I thought for starters, we should um, have, have a quick introduction to the game and discuss the data structures and the memory so that when we actually saw the code, we knew what, what that code was working on. So I hope you found this interesting. You know, go ahead and download the source code and yeah, have a go at YQuest. Maybe you'll enjoy it. Maybe you won't. Um, I'd say it was more it was more a tutorial and a proof of concept than it was supposed to be a, um, a thoroughly enjoyable game. But anyway, uh, maybe you can have some fun with it. Maybe you can modify it and make something of your own. I totally um, encourage you to have a go at that. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this today. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.